Abraham did not come from a privileged family. A lot of people talk about Abraham, but he wasn't, didn't come from some rich family somewhere. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. My name is Rod Hembrick. And I'm Jim. And this is Bible Discovery TV, our 32nd time through the Bible in 32 years. Thank you for joining us and being a part of what we're doing and where we're going today. It is Genesis chapter 11. Very interesting, Corey. Today, I'm going to be taking a look at mud bricks in the ancient world, specifically how they relate to Genesis chapter 11. Ryan? Well, today I'm going to be talking with Bodie Hodge from Answers in Genesis about a major event in world history that we read about in today's assigned scripture reading, the Tower of Babel. Excellent, Janice. Today, God's plans. All right. So make sure you get your Bible guide out and let's begin to, to look at this and study Genesis chapter 11 as we listen to what God is saying to us right now. Genesis 11, verses 27 through 32. This is the genealogy of Terah. Terah begot Abram, Nahor, and Haran. Haran begot Lot. And Haran died before his father Terah in his native land in Ur of the Chaldeans. Then Abram and Nahor took wives, the name of Abram's wife was Sarai, and the name of Nahor's wife, Milcah, the daughter of Haran, the father of Milcah, and the father of Iscah. But Sarah was barren. She had no child. And Terah took his son Abram, and his grandson Lot, the son of Haran, and his daughter-in-law Sarai, his son Abram's wife, and they went out with them from Ur of the Chaldeans to go to the land of Canaan. And they came to Haran and dwelt there. So the days of Terah were two hundred and five years, and Terah died in Haran. Genesis chapter 11, verses 27 through 32. Genesis 10 to 13, that's our reading today as we continue on going through the Bible for the 32nd time. It's the 32nd year that we have history of reading the Bible and we're reading it again. You know, many people know about the biblical man named Abraham. Even if they don't know much about him, it's common to know that he is important to at least three major religions in the world, Judaism, Christianity, and of course, Islam. Now, in the narrative of the Bible, Abraham is a key figure whose name changed from Abram to Abraham. Abram is a name that simply means father. Abraham means father is exalted. A large portion of the book of Genesis covers his story. And today's reading introduces us to Terah, Abraham's father. Their predecessors came and lived in Ur of Chaldees. Now, Abraham's journey brings him from Ur to the land of Canaan, which is promised to him from God. Now, interestingly, Abraham is the first man in the Bible who's actually referred to and called God's friend. The Lord confides in Abraham what fate awaits Sodom and Gomorrah, and the pair have several fascinating interactions. Now, the relationship between God and Abraham allow us to see God's plan of salvation begin to unfold and gives us insight into how God operates and actually who God is. This is fascinating as we begin to, that's one of my favorite words, by the way, as we begin to understand it and, uh, and look at it, and let me tell you, if you don't have your Bible guide, why not? I'll send you one. Write to us and call. Our address is on the screen and our phone numbers will come up as well. But another way to do this is go to BibleDiscoveryTV.com, BibleDiscoveryTV.com. I think it's important to remember that because when you click on the page there, it takes you to a donate page and then takes you to a page you can download the Bible guide. 
uh, just as you need it because God or, or we put together all of that for you. But today we're talking about the plan begins. This is the theme that we talk about from Genesis 11. Father, I pray as we begin with verse 27, because the previous years we've talked about all the other verses, but I pray this year that we would highlight and explain what it is that you're doing. Help us, Father, in Jesus' wonderful name. And we said together, amen and amen. Now, with that in mind, we come to the scripture. Verse 27 of Genesis chapter 11. This is what it says. It says, this is the genealogy of Terah. Terah begot Abram, Nahor, and Haran. Haran begot Lot, and Haran died before his father, Terah, in his native land, in Ur of the Chaldeans. Now, what's interesting about this is we need to understand that Abraham did not come from a privileged line. It is God who decides who will lead his people. You know, what's interesting is a lot of people think that humans decide that. A man goes and gets an education and he's all ready for the ministry. Well, that's not the case. Ordination actually means following God or following the direction that God has placed in a man's life. And when I started the church and I, I pioneered a church, I felt the Lord calling me to do so. I was not ordained. And people, my father was one of them who sensed God was doing this. And he, he came up and took over a service back in 2000. And he said, I need a service. And he, I said, okay. And he took over a service and he ordained me. That was my first ordination. And then there's several that followed that. But this is something we need to understand. We are not educated to become ministers. We are called by God. And then our education directs us in that way. Now, Genesis chapter 11, verse 29 says, Then Abraham and Nahor took wives. The name of Abram's wife was Sarai. And the name of Nahor's wife was Milcah, the daughter of Haran and the father of Milcah and the father of Izca. But Sarai had, was barren. She had no child. Now, again, we need to remember that Abraham's wife was thought to be cursed because she was barren. God is never limited by man's curses. Beloved, understand this. Mankind says a bunch of things to us, especially today in social media, with all of this going on and all the fighting going on, and they would have us involved in that. But just remember this, mankind says things, but it is God who does things. And so let's remember that it is more important what God has said through his word than what we say. Did you hear what I said? It's more important what God has said in his word than what Facebook chooses or what YouTube chooses or what any other social media chooses. And that's important for us to remember. God's word is the most important. All right. Now, with that in mind, let's go on to chapter 11, verse 31. It says, And Terah took his son Abram and his grandson Lot and the sons of Haran and the daughter-in-law Sarai, his son Abram's wife, and they went out from there to Ur of Chaldees to go down to the land of Canaan. And they came to Haran and they dwelt there. So the days of Terah were 205 years. Now listen to this, very important. And Terah died in Haran. Now why is that important? Here's the reason why. It's the third point. Abram's father dies, leaving them high and dry. Abraham must now fully rely on God for his future. Do you understand what Abraham had to do? He lost his father. Abraham had to rely on the heavenly father. And when we make decisions in our lives, we must make those decisions not based on what our father would do, not based on what our mother told us to do. Yes, we need to pay attention to that, but we need to decide what did Jesus Christ, God the Father, tell me I should live like? What did Jesus Christ instruct me to do? And when we do that and we pray about it and we discover things, then we make our decisions based on that way. That is the right way 
to make our decisions. Now, that does not mean that we will not make mistakes. We will make mistakes. But it is very important for us to realize when we made the decisions trying to seek God and we made a mistake, that's one thing. But when we made decisions seeking our own desire and we made a mistake, that's totally different. See, God has this way of making our decisions right, (laughs) even when they're wrong. Not that we seek to be wrong. But we desire to have good decisions made for us. Beloved, what happens is God, through his, I'm telling you, amazing grace, (laughs) he makes room for us and he helps us along the way. And that's called sanctification. God helps us. We make decisions and we go over here and God puts us back in line. And we make decisions. We go over here. God puts us back in line. Beloved, God corrects us when we seek his face, when we make wrong decisions. Now, most of the time, we'll make good decisions. But God helps us as we live with him and allow him to be in our lives and take control. Well, it's time now to carry on with our Bible study. And as I mentioned on yesterday's program, during our reading through Genesis this year, I decided to share with you all some recent interviews I conducted with our good friends at Answers in Genesis. I thought it would be really fitting since their ministry is so focused on showing how Genesis is so vital to the gospel and the rest of scripture. And if you watched yesterday's program, you'll recall that I shared part of my interview with Answers in Genesis speaker, writer, and researcher, Bodie Hodge. And in that clip, he talked to us a little bit about the evidence for the global flood of Noah. Well, today I continue my conversation with him regarding another major historical event, the Tower of Babel and the worldwide dispersion of the people there. Here's just a clip from our lengthy discussion. Okay, so there's creation, corruption, catastrophe, and then there's, of course, confusion. And now you've written a book about this called The Tower of Babel. And I'm wondering if you could share with us, first of all, why a study on this topic is so important. And secondly, what are the, some of the discoveries that you made? Yeah, it'd be good to see it. It's practically Sie Deutsch, yeah? Oh, wait, yeah, that's the Tower of Babel stuff right there, isn't it? Sorry, I threw some German out there. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, the Tower of Babel is significant for a multitude of reasons. First off, when we look around the world, we see a multitude of languages, and those languages continue to change. And so, you know, it really does explain that just, just that simple. From a secular viewpoint, if we evolved out of Africa from some lower ape-like creature, why don't we have, you know, a language that's based on this grunting and that sort of thing? And yet, we see languages all around the world that are intriguing. Uh, some read top-down, right? left, some are pictorial, some are tonal, uh, some using uh, alphabet and that sort of thing. So I mean, it's brilliant when you actually look at the grammar and structure of different languages. But the Tower of Babel is significant for a host of reasons. One of the big reasons is it helps explain the issue of why people look a little different in different parts of the world. We're in a culture where people, you know, they bring up racism all the time. And I, you know, one of the, my first responses to that is I'm all for the human race. You see, all of a sudden now people have to step back. Oh yeah, there is a human race. You see, when they want to break it down further than that, all of a sudden that becomes a racist view because they're wanting to subdivide the humans into different groups. Now, in a secular worldview, you you go back to people like Darwin and even some of his precursors, they separated people into a multitude of races. You see, the term race shifted meaning. If you go back, you know, 100 years before Darwin and somebody said, what race are you? Oh, I'm the Irish race or I'm the German race or the English race or, you know, the Chinese race or the Japanese race or whatever it might be. That term race shifted at about the time of Darwin. They shifted it into a multitude of races, but typically most of the time they settled on four races. They had the Caucasian, they had the Mongoloid, uh, they had the Negroid, and they had the Australoid. And those are evolutionary races. So that term shifted, and that's the way people think now. A lot of times on our government forums, they say, what race are you? 
you know, you click Caucasian, that's actually one of the four evolutionary races. So you can see how that has permeated our culture. It's even in government forms, kids are taught it nowadays. And that racist viewpoint has separated mankind. There are people who teach some people are more evolved, some people are less evolved uh, because of the so-called race issue. But when we start with the Bible, you get back, we're, we're all related, we're all one race, we're the human race or Adam's race, we all go back to Adam and Eve, which means we're all related, we're all equally made in the image of God, we're all equally sinners, all in need of Jesus Christ, no matter what we look like. So you have two entirely different views of looking at different people groups as a result of what ultimately occurred at the Tower of Babel and as sin has affected that. For the sake of time, I had to stop the interview there, but if you'd like to hear our full conversation, that it is available on this DVD set called A World by Design, the Niagara Conference. Also on this set is interviews with other Answers in Genesis scientists and speakers, such as Calvin Smith, Patricia Engler, and molecular geneticist Dr. Georgia Purdom. Not to mention my good friend and evangelist, Pastor Corey McKenna from, of course, the Cross Current Ministry. And over the next couple of weeks, I'll be sharing with you clips of some of those interviews as well. And believe you me, they answer very, very important questions relating to science and the Bible that are sure to help you witness to unbelievers. Oh, and before I forget, please don't get this set confused with my older set of interviews, which is called A World by Design, the Muskoka Conference. These sets of interviews were from two totally different creation conferences. So make sure you get both. More interviews to follow tomorrow, but in the meantime, make sure to check out the Answers in Genesis website at answersingenesis.org. There you'll find incredible content and resources. You know, Corey McKenna is a great guy. He really is. He is. He's been here a number of times. And he is something else. I'll tell you, Corey McKenna Creation or, uh, or he the is Cross Current Cross Current Ministries. Yeah. There's a lot of C's there. <laughs> um, he really is somebody who really has his finger on what God is doing, and he's excellent. Mm. Very, very, And he's got a good name. <laughs> he does, absolutely. <laughs> he does have a good name. Corey. <laughs> okay, speaking of Corey's. Okay, um, today you and I are going to be taking a look at uh, mud bricks. We're going to be looking at how ancient people built specifically in the area of Mesopotamia, because this is where, uh, you know, in the place of Babylon, uh, where the people decided to gather together and build the Tower of Babylon. And the Bible specifically tells us that they de decided to use baked mud bricks. Uh, so let's just jump into some of this ancient technology and we'll talk about it afterwards. Mankind has always looked to the world around him to survive. Building materials are no different. Caves, rocks, trees, and mud have all been used as natural and convenient resources to build shelter for basic living, protection, and awe-inspiring feats of architecture. The most accessible building materials vary from region to region, but one of the favorites of the Near East has always been mud. By amending already existing soil, long-lasting mud bricks can be created. Historically, these have been used throughout the ancient Near East, appearing even on the pages of the Bible. Beginning in the early chapters of the book of Genesis, baked mud bricks are cited as the building material of choice for the Tower of Babel. The enslaved Israelites in Egypt were employed in brickmaking and farming. And famously, the Pharaoh of the Exodus punished the Israelite brickmakers by refusing to supply their straw while demanding the same number of bricks be made. With several other mentions of mud brick in the Bible and the physical remains of mud brick found all over the ancient Near East, their usage was commonplace and their production essential. Though today more modern materials are generally used in building projects, there is at least one reconstruction project that required an archaeological experiment to preserve a crumbling site. At ancient Tel Rehov in the Egyptian Nile Delta area, archaeologists set about to preserve a site by creating their own mud bricks to build supporting walls. The project was carried out in 2013 and served to not only preserve the site, but also test out just how how the ancient process would have gone. Using known ancient methods and scientific analysis of existing mud bricks at the site, the ancient process was mapped out. First, topsoil was collected and mixed with water to create mud. Second, straw was added to the mud as temper and mixed in by foot. 
Straw chaff is what specifically would have been used, procured either from threshing floors after the harvest or collected from fields. Either way, the straw would have been chopped into small pieces before adding to the mud. It gives the bricks an underlying structure that has been proven to create stronger, longer lasting bricks. Third, the mud mixture received a good daily mixing by foot for several days and then was left for a few days to ferment. Fourth, the mud was then pressed into molds of the desired sizes and laid out on a floor dusted with an anti-sticking agent like sand, dirt, or more chaff. After a week of drying in the sun, the bricks were ready to use. In construction, mud bricks would be held together with mortar, and often the finished walls would be plastered over to create a seal of protection against the elements. Now, just like today, exact production of mud bricks could vary from region to region, and their drying could even be accelerated by baking in a kiln. You know, it's as simple as humanity uses what we have to accomplish our goals. We've always done that. It looks different today because we have different resources. Our technology is built upon the shoulders of earlier technology and even earlier technology. So here in Genesis chapter 11, uh, you know, ancient man is using the resources that they have. When you look specifically at Mesopotamia, at where Babylon was and later Babylonia was, uh, that area is not rich in resources like trees or even stone, the way Israel is very um, abundant in stone. Uh, but what they do have a lot of is mud. So they were using what they had available to them quite you know, ingeniously to create the structures that they needed to create. And we see this all over the ancient world is mankind just using the tools that they have available to them to make their lives better. Uh, so. This is mud bricks are one of the examples of that. And of course, they are going to come into play later on uh, in the scriptures this month as well. We're very, this is all very interesting stuff. I'll tell you, Genesis is awesome. And I just want to briefly thank the partners for staying with this ministry and faithfully supporting um, every single time, every month we have support from our partners. And we want to thank you and we want to praise God for you, people who've decided that they have to support a ministry that teaches God's word, and they do. So we thank you for that. We don't push heavy on finances and all of that, but I think it's very important that we thank you and you understand exactly what, uh, what God is doing around the world and what's happening. So thank you so much for that. We really appreciate it. Janice? Well, today I titled my segment, God's Plans, because as we're going through, especially in Genesis and as we go through the Old Testament, we're going to see a lot of genealogies written, a lot of names that are really hard for us in the English language to pronounce, and probably I'm not doing such a great job on them as I'm reading God's Word for the program. But as we're going through this, it struck me again, it reminded me again that each of us is known by God. He knows who we are, he knows where we've come from. He knows our families. And even though things are written down, even though some may think certain thoughts about you or me, it's God's plans that are important. And when I look in this genealogy of Terah's descendants, and Terah is, is um, Abraham's father, and we begin to read through here, we get to verse 30, and it talks about Abraham's wife, Sarah. And there's one verse that says, but Sarah was barren. She had no child. And when this was recorded, that was absolutely true. But God's plans for Sarah and Abraham were very, very different, weren't they? And as we get reading through, you'll see what I mean if this is your first time going through the Bible with us. So in Sarah's case, she's mentioned here in the scripture as being barren, but God knew the plans that he had for Sarah and Abraham. And it's God's plan that stands firm in our lives. He has designed us. There is a plan and a purpose for me. There's a plan and a purpose for you. And when we align our lives with God, when we're reconciled through him, and what I mean is giving our life to Jesus Christ, who came as a baby. We just celebrated a birthday in honor of him, celebrating the, his birth. He came to live and give himself in death on a cross to forgive us of our sins. There's a great song 
Psalm 139. And actually, I've got it earmarked in my Bible right now because there's a section of it. If you're sitting there today thinking, I don't know what God's plan is for me. I'm a loser. I can't do anything right. I was an accident or whatever it is that the enemy is whispering in your ear. Let me read this to you from Psalm, part of Psalm 139. And if you have a Bible, Turn to Psalm 139, I'm starting at verse 13. For you, and he's talking to God, for you, God, formed my inward parts. You covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise you for I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works and that my soul knows very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret and skillfully wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. Your eyes, God, saw my substance being yet unformed, and in your book they all were written, the days fashioned for me, when as yet there were none of them. Know today you are not forgotten by God. You are very important. You have a purpose in him. Get your life aligned with God. Follow after the Lord Jesus. Stay with us as we read through the Bible and learn together the promises in God's word. Sarah was listed as barren in verse 30 of the chapter of Genesis that we're looking in. But as we go through the pages of the Bible and we read what God's plan was for Sarah and Abraham, that certainly wasn't her destiny to be fulfilled. Yeah, that's absolutely true. Very, very good. I'm just reading it and I listen to this. In verse 16 of Psalm 139, you read it just a moment ago, the days fashioned for me. These were written in your book, uh, and, and that's very important. Well, we have a time on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday called the prayer meetings, and it's on Facebook and YouTube, and of course, it's on Bible Discovery TV. Go to Facebook or go to YouTube and look up Bible Discovery TV, and you'll find us. We're live at 3.30, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. That's New York time, and we need to do that. I'd love to see you there. We'll pray for you. But we need to pray today before the program ends, and we pray this way. We say, Lord, I want to praise your name. I want to praise your name for saving me and giving me eternal life. 